Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Team Building Podcast. We are live today. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a great, great conversation coming up with you, uh, with everybody here today with Jeff Cohn, and we're going to talk to Jack Cotton about how he built and sold his organization, and we're going to talk about all the systems that he built and all the things, the steps that led him to that sale and how he literally built a business that was scalable and sellable, which I know is a goal of a lot of the folks that we have uh, watching and listening here with us today. So so first of all, coming off of the uh, the ERS live stream broadcast, Jeff Cohn. Jeff, what's up today? Hey, Matt. How you doing, man? Hey, I didn't get the uh, legend, myth, hero. Uh, but yeah, Jeff, the man. The man, the myth, the legend. Well, when you start printing your own T-shirts I, with that on it, I, I don't have to say it anymore. I'm just going to buy the T-shirt. I, I, I always feel like I did something to offend Matt when he doesn't bring me in with that as, as my title. But it was hilarious. I was on Amazon looking for Christmas gifts, and – there's this big joke right now amongst like Z gens where you say my name is Jeff. It was from some movie, so everyone's like into this. My name is Jeff, and like it's like making fun of my name or something. I don't know. So the t- this T-shirt pops up and it says Jeff, the man, the myth, the legend. I was like, what? <laughs> it's in Amazon. I'm ordering it. So pretty, pretty hilarious. Oh, man. So, I would like to point out uh, Je- Jeff claims he was looking for Christmas gifts on Amazon. I I think maybe more like googling his own name. That's I'm just. Just putting that out there. <laughs> and Amazon throws this Jeff shirt out there. Eh, it probably yeah. would be something I'd be willing to exactly. do. That's definitely true. Yeah, Matt, exactly. love the background. Always in a new place. Of course, he only stays at the nicest hotels. Um, That's right. It looks like you're rocking out from a, a Hilton Garden or something. Yes, uh, downtown San Diego. Gotta love it. All right, let's uh, let's oh. get rolling with. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's winter in Omaha. I'll be there this weekend, so I will feel your pain shortly. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. So let's bring in our special guest, Jack Cotton. Jack, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. It's great to be here today. Yeah, we're really excited because you've got such an interesting background and a great story to tell. And I know there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of takeaways. So anybody that has the intention of building a team or is in the process of building a team, I think they're going to take away a lot from this conversation and they need to get out a pen and paper, basically. But uh, give everybody kind of just like a 60 second overview of kind of where you are uh, physically in the country and then where your business is at right now. And then we'll kind of get into the background and what led you to where you're at right now. I will do that. Great. I am on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Right now, I am in my beautiful, luxurious, but not overly ostentatious Cape Cod office. I have a studio up here on the second floor where I'm talking to you live from today. I've been on Cape Cod my entire life, born and raised here. I went to uh, college off Cape in Boston, where it, I've always thought I'd be in the real estate business in some way, shape, or form since the time I was a little kid, since the time I was building tree houses, tree forts, in the woods, in the fields, up in trees, under trees. You know, when things weren't going great in my life as a kid, which was uh, often the case, I would retreat to one of the little places I built, in a tree or under a tree, and slowly but surely, all would become right with my world. And that's a feeling I cannot get away from. That's a feeling I help other people get. And that's been my passion, my drive, my career, my calling since then. Very cool. So so where you're, where is your, I guess, where, in the stage of life where you're at right now, you are – <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but tell us a little bit about kind of the the journey to get you here, right? So you sold the, the you sold the team, the business, the the organization that you built in 2005. So tell me a little bit about what kind of what you're doing now, and then we'll dig into what led up to the sale in 05. Okay, well, yeah, I sold my company in 2005, and my company was a company, but it was really a, a team company, mm-hmm. and. Uh, For three years after that, I was a manager for the company who bought us out and um, opened a few more offices and hired more people, recruited more people. And then they hired a real manager after that, and it didn't work out too well. So I was back as an interim manager again. And when you know it, that manager didn't work out, so I was interim manager again. And then um, they find another real manager. And so that was great for a few months. And then what do you know? That manager didn't work out either. So I was back in again, but now we have a real manager who's been here for a whole year or more now. And so it's been really, um, what's the word for me? It's been very um, confusing the last few years as I bounced back and forth from being a sole agent to being a manager and back and forth. So now I'm just focused on selling a few houses, writing some books, teaching some classes once a month, and um, just doing fun stuff here in Cape Cod. Very cool. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are curious, Jack. 
about what the team looked like when he chose to sell it in 2005 and why you chose to sell it. So the big talk right now with people arguing between should I be a broker or should I be an agent, everyone wants to own a – or started to be a team leader. Everyone wants to own teams because they make a lot more money than brokerages, but a lot of people say they're a lot more challenging to sell for the exact reason you just highlighted, and that is the managing of the team. So when you have that sale – the angel comes in or whoever it is that picks it up, a broker picks up a team. The team's not the same without Jack, right? And people were maybe getting the results they needed without Jack. So why do you think there was so much turnover there? And then help our audience understand what that team looked like when you sold and why you sold. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to take the blame for the managers not working out. We made, we made some bad hires, and I take some responsibility for that. And we were basically um, – we were misled by a couple of people who wanted to be managers. Our company is a phenomenal company to work for, and people will say and do anything. We were faked out a couple of times. So, and when people moved to the Cape Cod, they, they didn't really understand what it's like to live in a resort market year-round, and it just wasn't a fit for everybody. So, you know, on Cape Cod, which is a second home resort market, finding professional people to be a professional manager is a real challenge. On Cape Cod, which is a second home resort market, most real estate companies, most real estate entities, most real estate teams are practices, not businesses. People think, people forget who's on vacation here in a second home market. Um, and here's a clue, it's not you, it's not me, it's the people coming here to be on vacation. So it's really hard finding professional people to manage in this location, and that was a real challenge we were having. So why did I sell? Honestly, I wasn't quite ready to sell in 2005, but a couple of things came together that made the perfect storm for me to do that. Number one, a buyer showed up, which is always a good thing, and it was a great time. 2004 was my best year ever. I don't think the company, which has grown like three times as many agents now, they still have not hit the numbers we did in 2004. Wow. Um, but I could see storm clouds on the horizon. I wasn't... I can't say I predicted exactly what would happen, happen, but I knew badness was coming. I really didn't want to do it again by myself. I also knew that the tax structure that um, had 15% capital gains rate with a 5% state tax for uh, capital gains and dividends, I knew that wasn't going to last for a long time. I had set up my team company as a C-Corp, and so um, capital gains tax was hugely important. And as you may know, most companies or most people who buy a team, they would not want to buy a C-Corp. They would rather buy an S-Corp or a proprietorship because they want to do an asset sale rather than a stock sale. So I had to, I mean, my buyer had to be willing to do a stock sale, which is um, a little bit more scary for them because they potentially pick up any liability from prior practices in my, my corporation. And also... Um, a stock sale, you can't write off a stock purchase. You have to have to. There's a lot of tax stuff I don't need to get into too much. But anyway, um, I, but for me, being a C Corp, a 15% capital gains um, rate was a seven figure savings in taxes over if I was a regular a C, uh, S Corp or something like that, or with higher tax rates. Hope that makes sense. So the timing was perfect yep. on a lot of different fronts. I wasn't what what was a, that best? What did what did that best year look like, Jack? Sorry to cut you off. In 2004, you said that's probably the best year they've had to date. What did that year look like in terms of units, gross commission, income, volume, et cetera? Yeah, I'm going to say the vo the volume was around 250, and the GCI was around um, five six, and um, mm -hmm. the profit was around 20 percent. Okay, great. And how many agents were there at that time on the team? Oh God, uh, in the 20s. 20-something, maybe. Okay. And yeah. were you also I mean, a broker our, our, owner? We'll say that again. Were you, was, did you own the brokerage as well, or was it just a team under a, a broker umbrella? No, I was a broker owner. I mean, I started as we, I started in my dorm room in 1974. I started my own business. Well, it wasn't wow. really a business. I thought it was. But um, I never worked for anyone else. We are the Galapagos of real estate. So we had no influence from any other, because I already knew everything. Because I was 21. Right, of course. And, and I went right. to college and everything. And then I went to college off camp, yep. so I, I knew everything. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a horrifying first couple of years, I can tell you that. So when you were acquired, were you acquired by an outside brokerage that took you under their umbrella? Or did the people that <clears throat> purchased you continue operating your brokerage? Well, they continued 
operating my brokerage under their brand, Sotheby's. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Awesome. Sotheby's International. So, yeah. the question that every top lead agent making a lot of money asks, and right. you know, there's agents right now that I that we coach that are netting over a million dollars a year off their real estate team, spending right. five to ten hours a week working on their business. Why right. would they sell? And you know, the evaluation on that, and I'd love your opinion on valuation of teams versus brokerages. But we look at like a maybe a three x, four x. So that's a four million dollar business. Today, for me, if someone offered me $5 million, I don't think I'd take it because I know my business can spit me a million dollars a year in the next five, and then I can continue earning that return in the years after. So what's the real well, reason for someone listening to sell? Well, that's a personal decision, case-by-case -case situation. You know, if you turn the right. clock back to 2005, if this, was, if this is 2005 and you saw the clouds on the horizon now, that were on the horizon back then, you might think differently about that because that million dollars a year may not be as certain as it, as it seems right at this moment. Right. So at some point, right. the cycle's gonna end. I'm a, you know, I'm a notoriously poor predictor of the future, and, um, but that was one time when I did get it right. But obviously, what's happening now can continue. You know, if you look what's happening with interest rates, we are gonna be at a point where 100% of the tax revenues collected by the government will be required just to pay the interest on the debt, the national debt. So forget welfare, forget defense, forget education, mm -hmm. forget everything. 100% of tax revenue is going to go to finance the $20 trillion debt. So you tell me what's going to happen when we get there. So I right. think we have... So if, if the doom and gloom happens, you know, and I and we listen to yeah. it all the time in the media, right. what, are the, what are our options, right? So... Like you sell off, you get $10 million, but you still have to put that somewhere. So now you're in foreign markets, assuming that yeah. the foreign markets are going to do any better than the local markets, you know, the national markets when the national markets tank. So I'm just, I'm curious, and I don't know how transparent you want to be, but you got the money from Sotheby's when they bought you out. How right. did you choose to deploy that capital so you could continue getting the same return or even a better return into that nasty market? Which, by the way, I was in college in 04. Unfortunately, I didn't get to have, I didn't have any capital to take advantage of when the market was so low. I wish I had. Hopefully, you were able to get in on that a little bit. A little bit, but I was, trust me, I was shell-shocked. I mean, it was a scary, scary time. I mean, I've been in business since 1974. That's 43 years. I've been through some major downturns. When I started in 1974, we were excited, thrilled, and ecstatic to get a 15% mortgage. I mean, that's how expensive things were. So, but this was the worst. I mean, the thing that happened in 2008 was even worse than that. Number one, I had more to lose. I mean, when I started, yeah. there was nothing to lose. Now I had, it was a scary, scary time. 57%, um, wasn't it, in one year? Dropped 57%. Yes, here it did. Here, I can show you places here where it dropped, yeah, closer to 60, but yeah, absolutely. And we haven't come back either. Our prices are not back to where they were. Which really? It's frustrating. Yeah. In some markets, they are, but we're, our market's not back yet. Yeah. Yeah, like San Francisco's already over, Way over. 07 so peaks. Yeah. In Boston, yeah, Boston's on fire, New York's, every, everything's on fire except um, Cape Cod. It's just, we're doing well, things are selling, but it's a very price driven market, very value driven market. Value has to be compelling for people to make a move here. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder if the vacation markets haven't come back, and I haven't looked at that. We're in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of vacation vacationers here, right, Matt? Unless your no, family lives here and you're coming back to visit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I heard the, the beaches aren't that great there, but um, yeah. it's, uh, it's, yeah, vacation markets with longer seasons, like if you, even if you want to be cold and you want to go to Jackson Hole or to Aspen, where there's a longer right. season, um, those markets are doing well. You go to Florida, it's a longer yeah. season. When you get to the Northeast, our season's basically six to eight weeks. And so mm -hmm. people are coming here, and they're, they're deploying huge amounts of money on second homes, but mm -hmm. we're just not back to where we were in 2004. I mean, what percentage money here, of the brokerage th this year did uh, a vacation sale versus a primary residence sale? What percentage you of it? the difference? Yeah, yeah what's probably, the split? I mean, are you... 90-10. Okay. Um, I was wondering, I was just, I, I had someone in town yesterday from Charleston and they were talking about some changes in regards to rent control. Um, right now, anyone that owns any property in Charleston, which is also a vacation destination, right. they can choose to VRBO the properties on a daily basis. And they're having some conversations about eliminating that ability in some regions and like be, be playing, you know, controller on 
which areas based on geographical location are allowed to do day-to-day -day rentals on VRBO and which ones have to be um, normal traditional 12-month lease agreements. Is there anything like that right now in your market? Not, no, not on Cape Cod. The main thing they're trying to do here is tax rentals, uh, like they do in Florida, like they do in New Hampshire. Like we have property in Florida and we have to collect rental tax. So we used to have property in New Hampshire, we have to collect rental tax. We don't have that yet, but that's the only thing we're really talking about here. Um, the, other, the other situation that is uh, affecting rentals, though, is that people have less time than they used to have when they're, when they're considering renting. In the old days, we'd rent for the whole season or rent for a month. Now with you know, sports and uh, kids' activities, they run far into the summer, so a lot of people don't get more right. than a week or two off. So rentals are getting shorter and shorter, and that's why you see these daily things kick in now. But rentals are a necessary evil. They drive buyers and sellers in our business. Understand, in, in our market, a lot of sellers are second and third generation property owners who inherited the property. They've been doing everything they can to hold on to it. Which are the property taxes of 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars a year. And without renting it, they can't afford to do that. And after a certain point, they just throw in the towel, they can't do it any longer. And so it becomes a listing mm -hmm. to us. So how well you handle the rental is, because if you can get a really great rental and do a poor job, then you're not going to get the listing. So right. you can talk about mm -hmm. a system, a business that needs to be systemized, that is, that's a rental business because it, it can kill you if it's not. Does your firm offer property management as well? No, we don't do property management, but the firm does do rentals. When we, when we did rentals, but it was my business, we had salaried people who handled the rentals. Now the agents do it, which I personally, I think the model of having salaried people do uh, rentals is the way to go. You can spiff them, but I, mean, I know people here who do, um, you know, a million dollars a year in rental GCI. And because everything's mm -hmm. salary, the, the retainage is upwards of 50 to 55 percent. Holy which is, those aren't the day to days. Those are the 12 month lease agreements. No, 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 no. Those are weekly rentals, weekly oh, wow. seasonal rentals. Goodness. Yeah, we don't. 12 month rentals here. Here's the thing if um, a year round rental, you're running to a year rounder. So you're going to get the bigger money and a better tenant and higher price if you do the seasonal route. If you get above five hundred thousand dollars here, you're not you're not selling to a year rounder. Most year rounders cannot afford a house more than five hundred thousand dollars here. There's exceptions, obviously, to the rule, maybe, but mm -hmm. basically, eighty five percent of the market above five hundred thousand dollars is second home in retirement, or third home and fourth home or fifth home. And so, the higher you go in price, the more likely this would be a seasonal. So rentals, most people I know don't do year round rentals. They only okay. do seasonal, which is um, so June, what, July, August. Why would September. someone use? Why does someone use your firm and not just put it on VRBO or HomeAway.com or Airbnb, something like that? Well, quite frankly, it's becoming a competitive thing. But you know, you've got to be real hands-on if you're going to use those services. And some of these people, number one, they're not here, and uh, right. some of these some of these homes are older, and uh, it's a lot of work to get them rented and keep the people happy when they're here. So they need yeah. to um, they need us. But I'll tell you what. Sense. Those, they're really killing the hotels on Cape Cod. Hotel occupancy is down because of the, the daily rentals. Yeah. It's affecting hotels yeah, more than it's affecting us. Yeah. So, Jack, I'm well, curious. That's who I've heard quick. is lobbying. Is... Oops, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Jack. I was going to say that's who I've heard is lobbying the hardest against the RBO, Airbnb, mm -hmm. and these weekly rentals. They're spinning it like the city doesn't want it because there's not enough tenancy for those that are living it, uh, working in the cities. But the truth is, it's the hotel companies are losing the business. That's it. That's at least what I've heard, rumor mill. I'm not in this world and, or this space at all, but that's what I've heard. Well, well, the hotels are losing the business, so they're lobbying hard. And the town, the municipality, is losing the tax revenue because in most locations, mm. those aren't taxed, unless you're, I say, in Florida. Mm. And quite frankly, even in Florida or New Hampshire, the two states I know that tax uh, short-term rentals, most people don't do it. They don't file returns and do it. It's a pain in the neck. I mean, yeah. we rent a place in New Hampshire for three months out of the year. We have to fill out forms 12 months of the year, even when there's no rental. Yep. So same with Florida. Well, so um, And I'll share with our work. listeners one, look, one little yeah. strategy I have is anytime I'm going to stay anywhere uh, when we travel for pleasure, um, if I'm not in a big city and I want to just go find a house somewhere, which is our norm 90% of the time, I'll message three or four different properties um, that I'm wanting to come and stay, but that I want to pay in cash 
and I'll ask them what type of cash discount they're willing to offer. So you're absolutely right in regards to the collection right. of tax revenue. I'm sure they're accepting my cash offer for reasons we won't say yeah. on recording, but it's not my, my responsibility to pay the tax no. on that money. It's theirs, and most will take cash all day long. Right. But as a landlord, I'm a landlord as well for my own personal portfolio. And um, if somebody pays me in cash, which is very rare, you, you, it's just not worth it. <laughs> and, and not to pay in the, in the Florida rental tax, I mean, it's six point something percent. I mean, it's just not worth it to me to. Oh, agreed, 100%. Yeah. Throwing it out there, it might work. <laughs> if I'm getting had... a discount on the buy side, not offering that as a solution if you're the landlord. No, 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 don't do that. That's the one thing about real estate, there's agreed. no cash. There's not much cash in our business. Everything is. Yeah, that is uh, very true. So, Jack, I'm curious just real quick, and, and we can get back to the systemization conversation, but uh, you mentioned just how how much that, you know, you can retain on, you know, a million GCI if you're paying salaries and that there's some great examples right. in your market in the rental side of it. So is, is that something you've ever thought or had thought about just moving your agents or starting to hire agents on on the traditional real estate side at salary with the SPIF? Not on the selling side, no. On the renting side. It's the ideal way to go, I believe. On the selling side, I don't know. I mean, it, it might work, but um, quite frankly, my retainage was already very high. My retainage was, um, if I can remember, I think it was um, 37 to 39%. Oh, wow. Even, yeah. Oh, goodness. Well, and this yeah. is before a lot of online lead generation came on, so you weren't paying thousands upon thousands a month trying to generate online leads to do the business you guys were doing. No, we were driving a lot of it from, well, we were the first ones on the internet. In fact, I wish I could find these ads. It makes me crazy I didn't save them, but our competitors used to run ads making fun of us for being on the internet. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and it kills me. That, I mean, I'm like, and people would be yelling at me like, what's this internet, the computers, you're crazy, you're going to buy magazines, and we don't, we want to see print, and you're, we don't want to hear about computers, and like, are you People like so uh, unbelievable, but uh, we were the, we were always early adopters of every technology. I mean, for me, hmm. being this long in the business, I mean, the biggest high tech revolutionary change in my business was when I sat in a Burger King parking lot in 1979 and bought an IBM Selectric II typewriter with liftoff tape that took your mistakes off the paper when you were typing. I mean, that was the epitome of high tech at the time. Yeah, I mean, that was like, this is so cool. And then when you had a, an Olivetti ET231 typewriter where you could type in a letter and you put the paper in there and you're going to do like 100 mailings, the, the letter would start, then it would stop, then you type in their name, return, address, return, and then it would type the letter mm -hmm. that it would stop for and put in some more personal information. And that's how you did, that was technology way back when in the old days. People don't understand, we couldn't even make a photocopy. We could, there was no such thing as a photocopy when I started. Yeah, that's insane. But we were, but we, <laughs> we, we, we adopted cannot technology. Relate. <laughs> yeah, we, we cannot identify. We, you know, yeah. Oh, my you know, God. My biggest thing, and Matt will identify with this, was just cell phone technology. Um, I got licensed in 06 in real estate, and people at that time were only taking one or two pictures. And one of the things that helped me differentiate myself is I would take 10 or 15 pictures. And that was like blowing yeah. people's minds. Oh, no, we, we always did that with photography, too. We always hired a professional photographer and took amazing pictures even though they were mostly black and white. But anyway, um, it, it's, uh, it's come a long way. I'm it's not sure. It's come a long way. So this is a fun, this tech conversation is a fun topic. Um, Elite Real Estate Systems, which is another coaching uh, organization that I own, and one of the main reasons we started the Team Building Podcast to point people towards Elite Real Estate Systems right. was to look at the future of technology and see how it can positively impact our business what do you see now with all this experience, starting from playing under the tree and in the trees, to selling a multi-million dollar business, to now still being a practitioner of real estate, managing, you know, and not managing the, the staff there with South, Sotheby's, right. and looking towards the next 10 or 15 years, which you don't seem like the type that's not going to be doing something, you know, you're a mover right. and a shaker. What's going to be the next thing? I wish I was that smart, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was that smart. Um, but you know what? I still believe that you're going to need people in this business. You know, we've gone from when I was a little kid in real estate, we were the gatekeepers of the information. You couldn't get to the market data without us because we had the keys to the MLS book. We were the gatekeepers of the information. 
Fast forward to today, we are now the packagers, presenters, and interpreters of the information for people because the information is all out there, but not everyone understands totally what it means. Or, or we make it more understandable um, how we present it to them. So we're not the gatekeepers, but we, we are still required to be there to package, present, and interpret for customers and clients. And I think our role that way is going to increase. I know there's people staying up at night, working all night, looking for ways to take us out of the, of the equation mm -hmm. because there's a lot of friction still in a real estate transaction. But I'm not sure the friction is so much from the realtor end. Um, I just think I, I would suggest the realtor is alleviating the friction. Yeah. You know, hopefully I mean, we're the WD-40 in the deal and we're not causing the problems. And I'm with you, Jack. I'm, I'm a big yeah. believer that we'll still be necessary and relevant. I don't know if it's the commission will stay at 6 or percent. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. too many moving pieces. That's the it's challenge. Too, it's, too big a, it's too big of an investment. There's too many moving pieces. You know, there's only so much that a robot can do. And quite frankly, even if it does happen, there are people who want to go to McDonald's and have dinner. And that's great. I love McDonald's. But other people want to go to a really nice restaurant with full service and they're willing to pay for it. And just decide where you want to be. I think what a lot of realtors forget is that just do one or the other. You can't be McDonald's and the Ritz Carlton at the same time. So decide what like your that. business is going to look like and focus on that and be that and be true to that, um, and yeah. you'll be fine. If you want to be, um, you know, low weight, low cut, cut that's great. Go ahead, yep. go knock yourself up. And there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. But if you want to be well, the Ritz Carlton, it's real an estate, interesting you, point, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. well because I think a lot of people equate those two things, and they equate say, building systems, for example, or just having a business that runs systematically with automatically being the McDonald's of real estate. So I'm I'm curious, kind of how you look at it, because obviously you're you're a systematic guy. You built a, a business that you're able to turn around and sell, but I don't think you probably looked at your business as a McDonald's type system. Absolutely did, absolutely did. I was between McDonald's and the Ritz Carlton. I love. I mean, have you ever seen what Ray Kroc, his system for making a French fry? Mm -mm. It's astounding. And I love French fries. I need to go research that because I love research French fries. That. The moisture yeah. content of the potato. <laughs> it takes two years to grow it to potato. You have to, you have to plant a field full of, I don't know, some kind of wheat that you plow under. Then you plant the potatoes in the second year. And then you pull, pull them out of the ground. And then you get to measure the moisture content. And then the grease. I mean, it's like pages of stuff to make a French fry. The system was so awesome of what he did. And while we were at a higher price point, I love the fact that, oh, this person doesn't work out, plug this person in because they can just follow the system and it'll, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. And then, you know who really started the whole thing? Was your dentist. I mean, dentists really started this whole thing with systems where you would have four or five rooms in an office and then put four or five people in there and then a tech would run around and put the bib on and do the initial check and maybe clean them up. And then the dentist just goes around afterwards and that's kind of what I see in the real estate business let other people do the setup the, the market preparation maybe the initial research and all that stuff but then the dentist or the brain surgeon comes in and takes all the data packages presents it and explains it to the people and, and creates a diagnosis yeah, and a prescription sure. I agree with that definitely that's the system yeah. what yeah. systems do you have in place currently in your your business that you feel has empowered the agents to sell more real estate, empowered the brokerage to be more successful? <clears throat> well, what we did, um, gosh, this is gonna sound awful. Um, but we tried to do, we, I hate to use the word golden handcuffs, but um, I gotta be so careful here. But what <laughs> we tried to do is we just tried to do everything for the agent. We wanted the agents and our team, our company, our, com our entity here, to be, to be meeting us. We did everything for mm -hmm. them. They didn't, you know, we did the listing presentation. We had a standardized listing presentation. We had a standard listing process. We did all the input stuff for them. We helped, we had a CMA process for them. We did everything. They just had to show up and show the property, yeah. negotiate the deal, and half the time, you know, I'd step in and, and help negotiate the deal as well. But the more you can create systems that make the agent's life easier, the less turnover and breakage you're going to have in your business. They're going to stay longer because they, it's hard to leave. I mean, we were paying. Golden handcuffs. The modern the modern word now for golden hand, handcuffs is value. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm a dinosaur. Yeah. What can I the tell more you? value you offer someone, if no one else can offer it, then they're going to stay with you, right? We just offer tremendous value, great integrity, and phenomenal systems, and great marketing for them. They didn't have to do anything. 
all their mailings were done, all the, every, I mean, everything was done for them. Yeah. And therefore we could charge, you know, um, a, a lower, we could get a lower split or a higher split, depending on which side of the equation you're on. And right. quite frankly, right. to me, you know, splits are like commissions anyway. What's, who cares what it is? What do you make it at the end right. of the year? I mean, you go to a seller and yep. somebody will charge you know, X minus two and you're gonna be X, well, so what? Here's why I bring you more. Here's where I bring more yep. value. And that's where people in this business are really forgetting that, you know, sellers have been conditioned over the years to think of all of us as toll takers on the Get Your Home Sold Highway and the way you maximize the transactions to minimize the toll. And most real estate right. people I see don't understand that they need to have a value proposition and convey the value proposition and then execute the value proposition so that it's real. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a great analogy. It's the same conversation with the seller that you're gonna have yeah. with a potential agent when it comes to commission splits or commissions. Absolutely. One of my favorite rebuttals when someone wants a better commission split, I say, honestly, we can charge you nothing. Just go sell it on your own. It's free, go do it. And that's the McDonald's, yeah. we're pricing, right? You can go to right. McDonald's that my kids eat there. I have tried not eating there recently. But like you can buy, it's amazing all the food you can fill a bag with for like $7. And I'm like, what is right. actually in here? What are you getting? And I tell sellers, that's the same experience. You'll have to do it on your own, save 7%. And you use like the dentist analogy, you can remove a tooth on your own. You saw it happen on Castaway. You yeah, know, there's a, there's a YouTube you on can that, take actually. a tooth yeah. out. Yeah. yeah, YouTube it. But of course that's gonna YouTube be painful ball. and you're probably not gonna net as much. Yeah, you might get infected and all that stuff, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, right, so I don't, it's not about saving money. People, just like you said, are conditioned to ask for that. And same with agents that are searching brokerages. They're conditioned because the honest to God truth is most brokers don't offer great value and most right. dentists might not offer great value. And you go down the list, you have to be intelligent and, and search out the people of value and all of us are willing to pay it if, if we right. find someone that we truly believe has the value to offer. So be because that person, right. obviously, that does that. And as soon as you cut your fee, for example, I always wanted to cut our fee because we, we charge the highest commission in the marketplace by one point, and I still do. And I, I, one of my favorite things in life is being able to say, I told you so. I just, I just love that. But so I was ready, to, I was really ready as a company to lower our fees to match everyone else. But I knew in another market down in Cape Cod, there's a great agent down there. He's got a great company. Well, it's not quite a business yet, but it's, he makes a ton of money. But he, he cut his fee by one point, and within four weeks, every other company in that market's a point below him again. So I tell agents, which point do you want to sell? The one between X and Y, the one between Y and Z? All you're selling is a point. You're not selling the whole commission, you're selling usually one point. Now in San Francisco, mm -hmm. there are agents taking listings for free. Um, just like, you know, when, you, um, when there's a horrific crime somewhere and they catch the criminal, what happens? Well, lawyers jump out of the woodwork who will take the case for right. free to get the PR. Right. And it always amazed right. me that a realtor's never thought about that until just now, they're doing it in San Francisco, where they'll, we'll take your listing for free and you'll just have to pay the buyer agent. And the, and the other agents are like freaking out. What do we do now? Well, what you do is you have to, instead of now selling one point, you're gonna sell a few more. And then if you bring in value and you can d demonstrate your value, it's just not a big deal, another 10 minutes. Right. Oops. Yeah, I don't know a lot of agents making a million dollars that don't charge anything and just make the money on the other side. So for those yeah. listening, there's all different ways to strategize. Do you want to be the person that offers value or that's all their commission and doesn't offer anything? So everyone's in a different cut, camp on that. And I love commission cutting. I mean, I, I mean, there is no greater vindication on the earth. There is no greater pat on the back you can ever get than to have your competitors cut their fee because that's them saying, you know what? There's nothing else we can do. Mm. We can't compete with you any other way. We have to cut our fee. And Love that's it. like, yes, that's the greatest compliment <laughs> you can ever receive that's, is to have that's everybody a great point. the commission in your market. That is yeah. a really good point. Great point. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's the same thing with brokers and team leaders that win on the recruiting front because they give someone a better split and not because they offer better value. It would be great if we could all play at the same level, but that's not what capitalism is. It's the same conversation you have with an agent that you have with a seller. You know, you sell the value right. of what you do. Well, here's one thing we do. Here's another thing we do. And Sally got three deals from this, and Bill got four deals from right. that. And let me ask you this: What's another four deals you're going to be in 2018? So, I mean, it's right. not that hard. Jack, I got to know about the wall behind you. I'm not used to seeing flyers with six images or six squares. Explain that to us. Well, 
I'm very visual. Those are PowerPoints. I'm writing a, a two-day lecture class, and those are all the slides, and I move them around on the wall because my even I have big screens on the other side of the room you can't see, and sometimes I put them on my big screen. But I still like having things on the wall because I'm I'm in that generation where, and that's um, the blue tape is um, easy on, easy off tape. So I can move, I can change the order all around. When I get it in the right. right order, then I just match it up on the computer, or sometimes I'll dictate a book right from the from the wall. Wow, I am glad I asked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. It's like beautiful mind right there. It's yeah, impressive. exactly. I didn't say I wasn't. I never said I wasn't weird, but anyway. <laughs> All right, Jack. So, Love how it. do people? Uh, Jack, do people let me ask you a fun question. I, yeah. Matt, I'm stealing the question real quick. Okay, go ahead. I have to ask Jack because of his beginning of this podcast today, talking about playing in the woods. What is your current playing in the woods? You said the back nine. That doesn't satisfy the true, you know, mountain man that I think is inside of you. So what did, what's the adventurous side of Jack that you'd love to share with our audience today? Well, I don't know what to say there. I mean, I love this business. This is all I've ever done. It's all I've ever wanted to do. It's not a career for me. It is a calling. When I'm mm -hmm. not doing this, I like to ride my bikes. I have, um, I have a 13-year-old and 11-year-old, aside from some older kids and some grandkids. And um, my 13-year-old loves to go camping, so we built a phenomenal ridiculous jeep we sleep on the roof of it and um it's wow yeah it's got a rooftop tent that opens up with pistons in the corners and so two people can sleep on the roof it's awesome but i'm an old man and uh two o'clock in the morning three o'clock in the morning is not that much fun coming down the ladder to do it all men have to do two or three times in the night so now we've ordered a uh, a four by four mercedes adventure vehicle that'll be here in february so we should just go off road and get lost spend the night or just tailgate or I just like being outside. I have a really nice boat. I like to, um, in the summertime, our season's kind of short here, but I like to be on my boat as much as I can. Staying on it, cruising on it, working on it. Not working like working on it. Sounds like, incredible. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> what's, Matt, what's a boat look like? I guess you know uh, now because you're in San Diego. I have no well, idea. I haven't seen yeah, one yet. To, There's a well, harbor right there, but I've never been I'll on tell one. what they look like. They look like a big pit full of dollars. <laughs> oh. I've heard oh, that before. That I believe, yeah. yeah. It's ridiculous. It's insane. I mean, I could be. Re I would never have to spend another day working if I didn't have a boat. I mean, it's like, it's, it's That's mean, right. It's mental what they cost. It's mental. There's, there's the, there's the profitable wealth building advice for today. Don't buy a boat. There you go. Tell your boat. Absolutely. <laughs> oh my god. This has been so, an awesome interview, Jack. It's, it's fun to see the people that I think. You know, who am I going to be 10, 20, 30 years down the road? Um, and I won't age you that much. So who am I going to be five years down the road? <laughs> yeah. And it's fun to see someone who sold their business, who chose to still stay in the business, which I think anyone listening to this, even if they were to sell their team or their brokerage, they'd still stay in it in some capacity. And you obviously have a passion for it. And we're so grateful that you're willing to share all the things that you guys have done up to this point. And we hopefully we can have you on again in the future. Matt, ask Jack how people can reach out to him. <laughs> Yes, Jack. <laughs> How can people connect with you? Uh, easy. Either go to jackcotton.com or search for Jack Cotton on Amazon. Perfect. And what what are they going to find on Amazon? My books. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Perfect. No T-shirt. <laughs> no T-shirt. No. No T-shirt. No. No. No T-shirt. Okay. I guess. And then tell Jeff, us about the book real quick. Watching. Give him a plug on the book. What's the book about? I Why don't... should someone buy your book? My book is called Selling Luxury Homes. You know, countless agents across the country sit on the sidelines of the luxury real estate business. They think you have to be born rich or well-connected to succeed in luxury real estate. My book takes you step-by-step -step through a seven-step um, process so that you can become a trusted advisor to the wealthy people in your marketplace. Love Perfect. it. That's awesome. Cool yeah, it is a cool book. Yeah, cool. Very, very cool. Go out, check out the book. It's on Amazon. I'm sure that you can get an audio version and yeah. the reading version, which is paper that will get mailed to them. You get a Kindle so. version, paper version. You get a paper cut. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 paper is always awesome. <laughs> All right. All right. And then for us, then, yeah. January 22nd is our next workshop. Um, our workshops groups have been amazing. I didn't think people would want to travel to Omaha in the winter. Um, every year it surprises me. People show up. They bring their hats and mittens and gloves and they come to Omaha, Nebraska. So Jack, we're going to offer you a free visit if you're interested in coming out to our team building workshop for being a guest today on our show. We'd love to have you come out to that event for free. It's usually $3,000. Wow. 
Um, right, our next right. event's January 22nd, but anyone listening can find all of the upcoming dates on our website, EliteRealEstateSystems.com. Um, that event is $29.97, but you can bring a guest with you. And you can also get access for free if you pay the $29.97 to our Google Drive, which houses all of our intellectual property. And then you'll also get added to our private Facebook group, which has over 300 individuals who have also come out to the workshop. So it's a really elite group of individuals that are thought leaders, that are constantly asking questions and sharing advice in and around the real estate space. So if anyone has any questions on that and wants to just simply message us, there's a simple link on the site that says contact us, and you can reach out and ask us more questions there. That's right. All right, guys, and then for the podcast itself, make sure to subscribe on YouTube or iTunes or Stitcher, depending on whether you want the video or audio versions. Uh, if you're getting value out of it, make sure to tell the other people in your world that are building teams or looking to build teams, uh, and then you can always leave us a fantastic five-star rating and review on iTunes to let us know that you're enjoying it, what you're getting out of it. We always read every single one of those and reach out and personally thank you for that. So, and, and just want to thank you guys for already sharing the show with all the people in your world. Uh, that's why the show continues to grow. You notice we don't do any ads ads for the show itself. Uh, so the show grows because you guys are telling other people in your mastermind groups and on Facebook and in the Facebook groups that you're active in, you're telling them about the show. So we just wanted to quickly thank you for that. So again, Jack, thanks. This was awesome. We really appreciate you being here. This was a lot of fun. Thank you to everyone that's watching live and listening to the replay after the fact, and we will get to see you guys on the next one. All right. Thanks.